Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz trumpeter, composer, and educator Jason Palmer. Originally from High Point, North Carolina, he studied jazz at the New England Conservatory, and in 2016 he released his new album, Beauty in Numbers. Over the years, he's gigged with Roy Haynes, Herbie Hancock, Jimmy Smith, Wynton Marsalis, Lee Konitz, and Phil Woods. He is an assistant professor at the Berklee College of Music and a visiting assistant professor at Harvard. He was the leading actor and director Damien Chazelle's first film. This is the guy that made Whiplash and La La Land. The film was Guy and Madeline on a Park Bench. And this guy, Jason, has stories, plenty of them. So please, get to know him and dig this interview, my friends. Hey, Jason, thank you for taking some time out. It was a pleasure to have you on the show already with your music, and I'm looking forward to speaking with you. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. So I'm going to go ahead and start off here. I know your latest album, Beauty and Numbers, great album. Obviously, as I said, I played it on the show. Uh, let me get an idea from you of what's going on with you lately as far as activity and even promoting this album pretty much on to the next one that record came out uh last year and i'm working i work with steeplechase and my contract with them stipulates that i can uh, do one record a year well i'm working on a live record right now and there's another project i'm planning in the spring but i haven't quite nailed down which one i want to do I, I teach here in boston so i'm preparing for the new semester doing that and rehearsing my band we're going to switch up our repertoire uh this year uh last year we were playing a lot of um music that's going to appear on my live album. This live record is a live record that we did at Wally's, which is a club I've been playing at for 20 years now. It features my um, quintet. It's two different configurations. Um, it's recorded over several nights. And one of the nights features a saxophone player and um, a guitar player named Max Light. And then the other night features uh, the same saxophone player and another pianist named Chris McCarthy. And uh, the saxophone player is Noah Preminger, and the bass player in the project is Simone Wilson and Lee Fish. Uh, Lee's been on Lee's on my Beauty and Numbers record. But, uh, yeah, I do one record a year, so I don't really go in in terms of promoting my records. I usually just record just to get my compositions out there to the world because I compose so much, and I don't really put out records in order to try to you know get more gigs or anything. The, the, uh, the distributor at Steeplechase, he sends out records and everything for me. He has a list, a, a really pretty big contact list that he sends out records to. So hopefully it reaches ears that way. Absolutely. Let me ask you about Wally's. I'm always interested, especially in the world of jazz, at these long tenures that you can have at these clubs. What What is it like to go in there on a regular basis? Does it feel like home? How do you feel about having a secure gig all the time there. Yeah, it's, um, it's really afforded me the ability to, to compose as much as I have because um, I have uh, have the ability to have a steady band that I can write for. And throughout the years, you know, a lot of students graduate and they move on, so I have to find another person. So then I have to write to fit that person's strengths and weaknesses and what whatnot. So um, it's... Um, Really lucky to to be able to play somewhere every weekend. I play every five days and Saturday, uh, every night, and it's a re really small, intimate place um, that has given me pretty much free reign to to test out music. And so, um, it's something that I wish every musician had, you know, because uh, back in the day, you know, musicians were working more and they had more opportunities to play live and test material and see what works, see what doesn't work in a live setting because, you know, nothing can really compare to that kind of thing. But um, it's it's, a, it's an institution in the uh, music scene here in Boston. Um, I think it got declared a national historic venue uh, a couple of years ago, several years ago, actually. So Right on. It's, at the market, yeah, it's one of the oldest um, clubs in, in New England for jazz, so. So are you from that area? Uh, no, originally I'm from North Carolina. I went to college in Boston. I started in 97 at uh, New England Conservatory. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've been here since 97. moved here in the fall, and um, I did my studies there. And then I started teaching um, in the preparatory school at, at New England Conservatory, and yeah, I think it was in 99. And then I started teaching in the public schools. I did that for about 14 years, and... And I stayed in a preparatory school at NEC for about 13 or 14 years. And recently I've been teaching at Berkeley for the past eight years. And I did a stint at the new school in New York for a couple of years. And I 
just finished a semester at Harvard this past uh, December. So I'm in this really bopping around on the teaching circuit. Right on. Let me let me ask you about growing up um, in North Carolina. What what was your childhood like? How did you get into jazz? Um, I was in. Uh, I think it was going. Yeah, going into eighth grade. I think it was. I, I was in concert band and marching band and those programs. And at the time, there was a big marching band, so there was a music program. And one summer. Uh, a guy named Mr. Morton came by, and he was promoting a camp that was going to start. Um, it was a John Coltrane memorial camp because John Coltrane grew up in High Point, the hometown there I'm from. Um, and so they were going to have this camp, and they wanted to see who was interested. And so I raised my hand, and I went to it, and I found out about him. And and at that camp, um, another guy came and brought brochures about this new school that was going to open. It was a music school called Greensboro Music Academy. I think it has another name now, the Music Academy in North Carolina. Something like that. And so I enrolled in that school for, uh, I think it was later in high school, uh, my sophomore year. I ended up going there uh, three nights a week. So there I was able to take private lessons and have small jazz ensembles and, and do it, and have ear training. And, and that's when I really got introduced to the music uh, through that high school. Uh, it was a night school that I went to three nights a week outside of the public school that I went to. Um, and I think that the turning point for me, the aha moment was when I heard Clifford Brown play on Steady and Brown, his, his uh, infamous solo, famous solo on Cherokee. And once I heard that, I just really realized the possibilities of the trumpet and I wanted to really learn what that was and so that kind of got me hooked you know hearing Clifford Brown for the first time and then um, checking out Miles and you know it kind of expanded from there. So did you always know that you were going to become a musician was that your dream or were there other things that you may have been considering that your life would turn out to be? Um, no I was really into basketball in high school uh, yeah one of the best programs in the state so I played play basketball up until my senior year. I quit my senior year and started to really work on music. And I had a really good uh, trumpet teacher who was really influential in getting me to college. His name was, his name was Ronnie Engel. At the time, I didn't really think. I was pretty naive. I didn't think you could go to school and major only in music and actually make a living playing music. Because um, uh, I was down in the South, you know, there's no, there wasn't any, any kind of um, influence to let me know that that was possible until I met Ronnie. And so he had me audition um, at NEC. He really wanted me to study classical and jazz. And, and at that school, they had strong programs in both, which was a blessing for me because when I got there, I um, met John McNeil, and he was probably the most, the strongest influence on me um, in terms of my trumpet playing and my views on improvisation. So um, I didn't always think I would be, but I think... Um, there was a turning point when I got to NEC up in Boston that made me really want to become a musician. And that was, I think, the fall of uh, 97. I went to Berkeley. I went up the street um, and heard Nicholas Payton and Roy Hargrove as featured guests with the Kendrick Oliver Big Man. And also on that was uh, Jeremy Pelton and Sean Ross. So it was a four trumpet feature for an entire concert. And, I saw the master class that they did the day, um, in the daytime, and then they had a concert at night. And after that concert at night, I just felt this powerful, it was kind of a spiritual awakening for me, um, the way the music touched me. And, and from that day forth, I said, you know, if I could make people feel the way that they made me feel that night, you know, I think that would be my calling. And so from that time on, I just devoted all my time to the practice room. I, You know, I didn't really have a social life. My social life was at Wally's. I would go sneak in and, and, and play because I wasn't 21. I'd go to the late sessions and sneak in, take notes, and listen to what songs they were playing, and then go try to find those records and learn those songs. So, yeah, I think in the fall of 97 was a was a turning point for me to really devote my life to um, making music and just being in that culture. 
So over the years, everything's obviously worked out. You played with legends, Roy Haynes, Herbie Hancock, Jimmy Smith, Phil Woods, Lee Conant. What have you learned from these masters, not only about being a musician, but about living? What, what were the greatest lessons you learned from them? Stay true to the music and really do as much as you can to learn the tradition and also um, stay active in, in creating your own traditions. Um, you know, with, with Phil Woods, I really learned the importance of of learning the original renditions of certain tunes and and then going from there. You know, he, he was always into really checking out the history and, and looking at scores and historical recordings and everything. And, and and to just be persistent, you know, and to stay focused and not let any no's in your career, you know, when you ask someone for help. If they can't help you, that doesn't always mean they don't want to help you. You know, it may mean that they can't help you at that time. And somebody like Roy Haynes, he would say, you know, if you stay in the game long enough, you know, you'll, your, your time will come and you just have to stay in the game and you'll get to play. Um, but, yeah, it's just – and also the the idea of just stretching your yourself out and, and trying to involve yourself in many different styles and learning as many different styles as you can and, and just being humble and staying present in the moment. And there's so many – ideas I got from from those players, you know. And I also got a lot of insight from my peers as well, just in terms of dealing with the business and and knowing how to navigate yourself in the musical world. I think uh, one of the most influential people for me was uh, Greg Osby. He was one of the first people to really take me under his wing and give me a lot of work. Um, and I was in his band for a couple of years, and we did several tours in Europe, and I'd never really been to Europe. And, so he um, really taught me the ins and outs of being on the road and how to survive on the road. And, and, uh, and I really thank him for it because uh, that was kind of a springboard. I got a lot of other opportunities from playing with him. I got my first record deal and stuff. So, yeah, he was really influential. You know, over your career, you've won awards. You know, 2014, you got the French American Cultural Exchange Jazz Fellowship. You've been recognized throughout your career, and I don't want to know what the favorite award you have is, but what one did you get that surprised you the most that you just didn't expect? Every one of them I really didn't expect. Uh, well, there was one here in Massachusetts. They have a uh, Massachusetts Cultural Council um, Fellowship Prize, and every other year they switch the groupings of art disciplines that they offer. And this one particular year I applied, and uh, it was in the field of composition. And so I sent in some songs off of my first record, and I ended up receiving one of those fellowships, and I was really surprised that um, that, that would happen. Because that was my first time applying for that particular grant. And usually if you want to, you know, receive a grant from any foundation you have to apply multiple times. Just like this French American thing, I applied probably three or four times before I got it. So that was probably the one of the most surprising ones. The French American one was a surprise as well because that's a huge pool of applicants and back in the uh I think two thousand seven, I think I won yeah, I won the Caruso International Jazz Solo Trumpet Competition. Um I was really surprised about winning that. I think any Anything is surprising nowadays because there's so much uh, competition and everyone's working hard, you know. So a lot of times it's just a, a, it can be a pick of the draw, you know, as to who wins what. But, you know, you're on the other side of it, so you never really can tell um, when you're dealing with the sub subjective art form. You know, you can kind of thank the, the energies in the sky to, to say, oh, you know, what... I was playing or what I played really touched that person on that particular day you know, so far as what the judges would hear. And, stuff, so. and I've been on both sides of it, too. I was on a couple of panels a couple of years ago for these certain grants and stuff, so I really got to see how they work and um, what they have to deal with and how many applications they have to sift through and how much time and energy it takes to invest in each applicant. You know, So you know, I've kind of learned a lot in that aspect too. You know, you've been on over 40 albums as a side man, um, A plus on your own name, you're on Steeplechase. How do you feel about your career? How everything's gone? As far as recording, you're an educator, you perform, 
How do you think things have gone at this point? Well, I've been really lucky. Um, yeah, that's probably where I would say um, there's a lot more I'd want to do if there was more time in the day. Um, but, but you know, I have a really great family, and so, you know, I, I can't really complain. Um, you know, I, I think in this year I want to do more to um, to be of service to the community, you know, outside of my actual job, you know, uh, you know, teaching and, and playing. So I've been trying to cook up some ideas on how I could uh, have more outreach. What about your acting career? I noticed that you've been in multiple productions. Talk to me a little bit about how you got into acting and how that plays into your life as an artist. Oh, I'm not really an actor. Um, I haven't done anything besides the guy in Madeline. Um, and that was kind of a, man, that was a funny story. I don't know how much time we have, but I'll give you the <laughs> synopsis about how that happened. Uh, Damien Chazelle, he actually won, I don't know how many Golden Globes yesterday. Um, he's the director of uh, La La Land, uh, the movie that's out now. Yeah. But his, his first film was Guy and Madeline, and I started in that movie. And initially, he came down to Wally's looking for a drummer to play the main part in Guy and Madeline, his first film. And he came on a night when I was out of town, so I wasn't there, but the drummer in my band was there. So Damien, who's a drummer himself, asked Lee, my drummer, if he'd be interested in you know, being in this movie that he was putting together for his thesis project at Harvard. He's a film student, I think it was. And so um, Lee wasn't interested, and so Damien left, and he came back a couple of weeks later when I was there playing and and then he had a, I guess, a change of heart and wanted to have a trumpet player in the lead role. So he asked me if I'd be interested. I was like, sure. You know, didn't really think anything of it, you know, because I get those kind of inquiries uh, every so often. So I said, yeah, sure. And I gave him my info. And he called me a few days later and said, yeah, can you come over and um, shoot some scenes and meet the other lead actor, actress, um, Desiree? And I was like, sure. And so we shot some scenes and that began... Uh, a two-year uh, process of putting together Guy and Madeline. And so this was one of the, I think it was one of the first films in the mumblecore um, genre of film, which I hadn't heard anything about. Uh, but I guess it's a a form of film that involves actors who've never acted and, you know, improvisatory scripts and everything. And so this movie, Guy and Madeline, the, the, uh, Everything was improvised. Um, the music, there's a lot of improvisation in the music, in the score, and um, all the dialogue was was um, improvised and everything. And so he put that film together, and then he submitted it for his final project at school, and he also submitted it to a lot of um, film festivals and competitions around the U.S. and around the world. It started to pick up a lot of traction, and it ended up in the... Tribeca Film Festival um, the following year, and that's when everything started to take off. He got uh, main dis- uh, big distribution and everything. And it played in all 50 states and in movie theaters and everything. And so I got to walk the red carpet and, and um, I did a bunch of interviews for that film. And but you know, I think it, it was something that was pretty foreign to me at the time. And if asked again, I wouldn't prefer to play that big of a role in a film. Um, he had asked me to be in La La Land, but I couldn't make um, the date that he wanted to shoot in. Shoot, shoot in. I think he was doing it in L.A. at the time. But, um, you know, it was just a, a snapshot in time in my life. And, you know, I think it was it was fun. Um, it was a fun when I met a lot of cool people and and just throughout the years, I've kind of run into people, and they say, oh, yeah, I remember that movie. Oh, yeah, you blah, 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 blah. So, so it really hasn't affected me in the aftermath of, you know, the, all the, the the wave that that movie had. You know, it's kind of, it's, I think it's going to have a little surge of popularity now since La La Land's done so well, and La La Land's a, a uh, bigger version of Guy and Madeline. The plots are pretty parallel in those yeah. two movies. So we'll see. I haven't seen La La Land, but uh, I'll see it soon. Yeah, right on. So let me ask you this. Speaking of a snapshot in time, so to speak, you know, 
in the lore of jazz history, if you could go back in time, get into a time machine and see a musician or a performance, where would you go and who would you want to see? Oh, geez. There's probably no one player. I'd love to see Clifford Brown, of course, any configuration with any band. Um, I would have loved to have seen Book a Little or Rashawn Roland Kirk, just any any of the great players who who had uh, you know really strong convictions in their playing. Mingus, Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, just, um, Woody Shaw. I couldn't really nail it down to one. Clifford Brown came to mind first because I don't know his his life was so short and his impact was so strong that um, you know throughout my life I haven't met that many people that. Uh, that knew or played with him or seen him play live, or saw him play live or whatever. Um, but the people that I have met, played with that knew him, they've all, they all have strong memories of him and his playing and his, his, uh, his, his personality and everything. So I think he's probably the, the, the main one that uh, etched. Let me ask you this a generic question. Why do you love jazz? It's an art form that connects people. Uh, you know, I've, been the over 30 countries and play with musicians and touch people who don't play music and play music with people that I can't speak languages with. It's, it's something that that connects the, the deep inner ability to improvise and to create energy with somebody. You know, I think it's one of the most intimate things you can do with another person is to make music with them and, and transmit that music to the listener. Um, and there's another Clifford Brown story. There's a there was a lady that came up to him after he played at concert and said, I don't know what you're playing. I didn't know what you were playing, but you sure were playing um the A T double hockey sticks out of it. And so just to know that somebody could be touched that way, to to have them touched in a way that would allow them to come up to you and, and say that they really felt your conviction in what you were doing. Um to that degree, I think that kind of inspiration is something that's needed. Um, and I think jazz is just one one medium that you can express that in. Um, so I think when when done the right way and done with conviction and and love, I think it's it's one of the most powerful um, things that you can have on this earth. So, and it's one of uh, one of the few art forms that's just really inclusive. It's music that's you know, made by everybody for everybody. And so I think it's it's one of the, the things that can really show the greatness in humanity. You know, in this country alone, it was one of, it was one of the first integrative things. You know, Teddy Wilson, he joined Benny Goodman back before baseball integrated, you know. So and Louis Armstrong had Jack Teagarden, you know. I think that was even before baseball integrated. So, you know, it can really bring together um Different different cultures and everything. So, I feel lucky to be a part of the the culture in that way. So, beautiful. Everything's going to come down to this final question here. I want to ask you, and it's this: Everyone has a version of you, your family, your friends, your fans, business associates. But when you wake up and you look at the world, you face the day. Who are you? Oh, I'm a husband, father, my son. You know, I think uh, music comes after all of that, you know, I think music is just a, um, something that that we are, but we can't allow it to define ourselves and we can't let it um, get in the way of what really matters. You know, I have a, my daughter's going to be three next week, you know, when I wake up and, you know, I, you know, I think about, I think about them and, you know, I think the work that we do kind of reflects, you know, how, how we are, um, in terms of how we relate to those that we love. You can't really separate the two, you know, how you treat others and everything that has a direct correlation to how you play how you play music, how you compose music. And so I think um, I've always tried to, to put that first, you know, to, to be the most empathetic, compassionate, you know, human being uh, as I can, so... Just try to live in the light and everything, so, yeah. Perfect. That's a great way to wrap everything up. Jason, thank you for taking some time out. Thank you for the music and your stories. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Joe. 
Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Jason for his time, his honesty, and stories. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store, visit NeonJazz at YouTube.com, or for all things Neon Jazz, go to the NeonJazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the music, my friends. Neon Jazz.